we can't cover this topic appropriately enough without doing some research ourselves. So I went and Googled. The thing everyone does when they're trying to find information, you go Google it, right? Well, you know, when we Google things, we see things that are true and things that are not true. We find everything. We find everyone's opinion. When I Googled about heaven and being real, I got 296 million results in seconds. I think it was 52 seconds. I got 296 million results on heaven. It is a very popular topic. Many people, whether you're a Christian, a believer or not, you want to know what is heaven and why are people talking about it. People want to know what's next for them when they die. What happens when we die? Do we go to heaven or hell? Do we go to sleep? Do we wait for Christ to come get us? What actually happens when we die? Well, there are lots and lots and lots of books out there about heaven. Some with biblical references to heaven and people's interpretation of that, to the very popular stories that are in books about near-death experiences people have had where they visited heaven. Notice the stories that are very popular all happen to be books on the New York Times bestseller list, which tells you something about the fact that people are very interested in hearing stories. True or not true, they are reading these stories and gulping them up, trying to understand what does heaven look like for people who've said they've been there. Well, the only book written and inspired by the creator of the earth and the heavens himself seems to be missing from the search, and that is the Bible. The Bible never showed up as a book about heaven and is heaven real. Wouldn't you want to go to the source? Wouldn't you want to go to the creator of the heaven and the earth to find out what he thinks heaven is going to be like? Why are you reading fiction books. Some considered nonfiction for sure, but I would think the creator of the heavens would be the one you'd want to get that question answered. Well, God does give us answers, and he shares many scriptures about what awaits us in heaven. There was a song, and it was a very popular song years ago in parts of the world by a gentleman named Harry Seacombe, and it was called, If I Ruled the World. What a beautiful, peaceful song. In the words of the song, he sings, If I ruled the world, every day would be the first day of spring. Every man would be free as a bird, and every heart would sing a song. There would be sunshine in everyone's sky. And it was funny, as I was Googling the name of the song and the lyrics, that a very popular song called by the same name, If I Ruled the World, popped up at the top of the list. And I thought, wow, somebody must have rewritten his song. And it was written by Nass. His sounds very different and is very reflective of our culture today. Now, his song says, If I Ruled the World, life, I wonder if it would take me under. Imagine smoking weed in the streets without cops harassing. Imagine going to court with no trial. If Coke were cooked without all the garbage, we'd have all the top dollars. Sad, but very reflective of our culture today. Going from somebody that says, if I ruled the world, every day would be spring, to if I ruled the day, let us smoke weed in the street without being harassed by cops. Imagine that. What a difference it's made. In 40 or 50 years, how much our culture has changed and how much it's reflected even in the words of a song. What would it be like if you ruled the world? What changes would you make? Some may make laws that everyone can sleep till noon, or perhaps you might say all vegetables need to taste like chocolate chip cookies or some delight that you like, changing the flavor of things that would you'd enjoy more. I'm sure, though, probably, if you answered that question, you would think about more serious things, bigger things like peace, love, joy, and harmony in the world. I'm sure you'd want to do away with suffering and sadness and poverty and violence and death. Those would be things you'd probably want to take out of the world. 
No more wars, tears, disappointed hopes and dreams. If you would make a world of perfect happiness and peace, then what kind of world do you think God would make if he ruled the world? Well, we know the answer to that question, don't we? Look at the first book of the Bible, and in Genesis we see that he did create a perfect world without all of that stuff in it. No sin, no suffering, no sadness, no disease, no discouragement, and certainly no death intended. That was the world God created. That was if he ruled the world, that's what the world was going to look like, and that's what he did. He created that at the beginning, and you'll find it in Genesis in the very first chapter of the Bible. Then we go to the very last book of the Bible, and we find that he's made a perfect world again, just as perfect as it was in the beginning. So what happened between Genesis, the first book of the Bible, and Revelation, the last book of the Bible? We have a perfect world at the beginning. We have a perfect world at the end. What happened in between? As we look at our world and we read between the pages, we see that sin entered the world. With sin became war, starvation, violence, suffering, confusion, death, and it doesn't even remotely look like the world that God originally intended and created. We are living in between the perfect earth created at the beginning and the perfect earth that will be restored as promised by God. Life in the middle over the ages has not been easy for any generation that has lived. We see through sin that Satan made this world his personal playground. But not forever and not long. God promises us that in his word. Everyone here knows what pain feels like. What it feels like to lose someone to death. What it feels like to struggle and to fear and to worry and to deal with illness and sadness. We all have experienced that. Through the ages, everyone has experienced that. But I'm here to share this amazing book called the Bible with you and tell you that it says that we are almost through with this old, cold, sinful world. We are in the end of times. We talk about that. Part of the title of our church is Adventist. We're looking forward to the advent of Christ returning to take us to our heavenly home. Soon we're going to be called to that eternal home, and we want everyone to be ready, but we need you to know the truth found in the Bible. We're going to go home, and we're going to spend a thousand years with God in heaven, and then we're going to return to live on this newly created earth as it was when he created it in Genesis. And it's going to be incredible, and we're all looking forward to that. Those of you sitting in the pews are here because you believe that God said we will be there, and we're all looking forward to going there. And that's what we're here to talk about, is what does that look like? God will restore the new earth and our future home, and it will be perfect. We don't understand the word perfect because we live in a sinful world, but we're going to see what perfection is. You read that God created the original planet Earth perfect in every way. But then we read that sin entered it, and it ruined everything. God will recreate the Earth and make it perfect again. We will look at the Earth made new and the incredible wonders that he had in it. Back when God created the world, everything he made was good. We don't understand that. Think of living in Eden. The air was pure. Imagine what we're breathing in now from the polluted world that we live in. Magnificent fields were covered with beautiful flowers. The lush landscapes of Eden made anything on earth pale in comparison. There was no death. No leaves fell off of trees and decomposed. No weeds to pull up. Yay, right? <laughs> we, we won't be pulling weeds in heaven. Flowers retained colors of yellow and pinks and purples, and they never faded. Can you imagine? 
Some of us, when we go places, we take pictures where we go because it's so incredibly beautiful. We know that we won't see that long, and we may never see that again while we're here on earth. So we take beautiful portraits and say, look at this. This is incredible. And what it should do is give you a glimpse of heaven. Fresh fruit from our Creator. No need for herbicides and fungicides and pesticides and all the sprays that we have to put on things to keep our fruit fresh. Fresh crisp apples and plums, grapes and juicy pineapples, delicious mangoes. It'll be an incredible feast for our eyes. Waterways that are filled with fish of every shape and size and color. Imagine diving in the waters of Eden. Animals not being afraid of each other. Our minds really can't even fathom that because we've been raised with the food chain, right? We've been taught since early on that there's a big food chain and every animal devours the one beneath it. And so we can't imagine a world where all the animals love each other and enjoy each other and get along together. God's design was to place Adam and Eve in that garden to live there forever. There was never intention that they would die at all. They had healthy bodies, and the atmosphere was full of love, and it was pure. There were no barriers between Adam and Eve, and, and anything that would be between them and their creator. They walked with God. They talked with God. No distrust, no hatred, no jealousy, no resentment, and no politics. What a beautiful world that was. But sin interrupted that plan. Adam and Eve rebelled against God by choosing what they wanted over what God said. They placed their desires and their opinions above the sovereignty and the authority of God. And we know what happens when we do that. God had to tell them to leave the garden that had the tree of life, lest they become eternal sinners. You see, if you're a sinner and you stay in the Garden of Eden and you keep eating from the tree of life, you will live forever and ever, and that sin will be there forever and ever. God could not have that. He didn't create sin to be forever and ever. He had to put an end to sin, and we know how he did that with his, his son, Christ. Sin would last forever if they remained there, and so they had to be banned from the garden and not be able to eat from the tree of life. God promised Adam and Eve that Eden would be restored Many prophets looked forward to the time of restoration when Eden would come back. Acts 3, verses 20 and 21 says, And that he may send Jesus Christ, who was preached to you before whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things. What a beautiful promise. Which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets. Since the world began, God knew at the beginning that once sin entered, he had to get us back and restore Eden back on this earth. God promised one day he would make earth all over again. Its waters would be pure and justice would abound and there would be no starving children. All things would be restored and perfection would be brought back to the earth as he intended and as he created in the beginning. The Bible says in 2 Peter 3, 13, Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. A problem in secular society, our minds and bodies become confused. Cars, houses, clothes become our gods. TV personalities become our idols and our gods. Our minds only focus on what we see and what is in front of us. The TV, the internet, whatever is showing in front of you is consuming your mind power. Satan uses every desire of our heart to tempt us away from spending time and worshiping God. And he gets us to subtly begin to idolize things of this earth and this life. Materialism creeps in and little by little, we see things we want, and then we just have to have them. Those are the things our mind are focused on. We are amazed when we downsize that we can live with so much less than we thought. You just ask any of us who are in our older years that are downsizing and realizing, 
how free it is to live with all that we have carried around. They are burdens and weights on our life, and when you remove them, you feel free. You have time now. You can focus on things of God and not on things of this earth. One day in the new world, there will be no suffering, no heartache, no sorrow, no death. And that is a reality. That is what will happen. Everything else is just a distraction that is holding a place in our mind or a pretense. One day you and I will look up into the heavens. Revelation 1.17 describes that day. Behold, he is coming with clouds and every eye will see him. That is reality that one day Christ will come back. It will be a day that we do not expect, so we must be prepared. Matthew 16, 27 tells us, For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward each according to his works. When he comes, he will have his reward, which means it's already decided. Do you understand when Christ comes back, he's coming to get the righteous. How does he know who are the righteous and who are the wicked? That has already been decided before he comes back. We are living in this time of judgment going on in heaven where everyone is being looked at. The record of your works and your faithfulness in Christ and your ability to follow his commandments and understand the testimony is going on right now in heaven so are you in that discussion? Are you prepared to be one of those righteous? That has to happen now. That cannot happen when Christ comes back. When he comes back, it's decided. It's done. We read the whole story in Revelation. It's very clear how these events take place. And when he comes back, he's coming to get the righteous. So he already knows who they are. That means you need to be preparing to make sure, make sure you yourself are one of the righteous. It will be too late once he comes. There have been books put out there, and we've talked about this several times. There have been books to out, to put out there that talk about, oh, the tribulation and the rapture, and you'll have time once, you know, the, the good people are taken up. There'll be a seven-year period where you'll have a chance to change your mind and really find God, and then you go up the next time. There's no next time. There's one time, and it's going to happen. And are you going to be in that one time? And so that's what we're here to prepare you for. Understand what Revelation says. Understand the process. I mean, I've been one that I've said many times, I always like the end of the movie before, the begin before we get into the middle of it because I want to know how it ends. And Revelation tells us that. It tells us how it's going to end. Who wouldn't want to know what the outcome is? So we have a chance. God is so good to give us the end of the story so we can prepare now to make sure we're part of that righteous group that goes up with him when he comes. He will come and take you, but you need to make sure that you're in that righteous crowd. The sky today we talked about is polluted. One day it's going to reflect the glory of God. The entire earth one day will reflect the glory of God. Every eye will see. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Have you lost someone by death? Maybe a wife, a mother, or a dear child? God will restore all things. Christians never say goodbye for the last time. One day earth will shake, and as the thunder rolls and your loved ones in Christ will be raised up and stand beside you looking up at the sky eliminated by the glory of God. By the way, it is not going to be a quiet event. You ever, If you've ever heard an earthly trumpet, can you imagine one coming from God? That will be a loud sound. Everyone will hear it. There is not going to be a secret rapture. A secret is something that's quiet that might be whispered. This will be loud, and everyone in the entire world will hear it and see it. It is a one-time event. It is not... 
I'm going to come get a few people and sneak them off the earth, and then I'll come back for the others later. You've got to understand Revelation. Don't believe what's written in the fiction books or man's interpretation of the fiction books. You've got to read Revelation for yourself. God will eliminate this in your mind. He will help you see the truth because he always wants you to know the truth. He'll put people in your path that can help you understand what the truth is about what it looks like when Christ comes back. This is reality. Christ will come and restore all things as he promised. It is evident that something is wrong in this world. In Africa, one tribe is killing another. In the Middle East, the Palestinians and the Israelis constantly fighting. Children dying of starvation with distended bellies. Highways full of drunken drivers killing mothers and children. Hospitals full of cancerous, dying people. Young children overdosing on drugs. Mass murderers of innocent people, even children in school. Something is very wrong on this planet. Christ promised us it would not last forever. He is coming back to restore all things. You were not made for sickness. You were not made for sorrow, heartache, and disappointment. You were created for joy and happiness, gladness, to live forever and not die and have a direct connection with God, our Creator. One day, the Bible tells us when Jesus comes, our bodies will be changed. The Bible describes it this way in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 52 and 53. And we shall be all changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal will put on immortality. Our bodies are perishable, and we feel it in our stiffness and our aging. The good news is one day eyes that are blind will open. Ears that are deaf will be unstopped. Rheumatism, cancer, diabetes, all the illnesses on this earth will disappear. It is only when he comes that he promises us to get our immortal bodies. This is very, very important. I'm not going to skip over this quickly. Many people are fooled thinking that as soon as you die, your soul is immortal. No, that is not what the Bible says. The Bible says when he comes, we will be changed from mortals into immortality so we can live forever. It is at that point that we get our immortal bodies. There is no immortality going on now. People that have died are not floating around in heaven. They're not in an immortal soul or body. God says it happens when he comes to take us back to our heavenly home. That's when we get our immortal bodies. So people do not get them when they die. It's a comforting thought to think that happens, but it's not the truth of the Bible. Again, we go back to the book of the creator of human beings and the planet and the heavens. And that book tells us the truth. That's why we've said many times when Ellie and I have been up here teaching these prophecy seminars, we have said multiple times, don't trust just what we say. Trust only what the Bible and the word of God says. So you have to read it for yourself. You can't depend on somebody standing up here telling you what to believe. Christ will open your eyes and let you see it in scriptures yourself. That's why we make so many scriptural references. We want you to read it for yourself and believe it. We want God to speak to your heart. In, in 1 Thessalonians 4, 17, it says, Then we who are alive and shall remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds. This is when he comes to get the righteous. To meet the Lord in the air... And thus we shall always be with the Lord. The good news is when Jesus comes, we get our new bodies. This is another important point. We've talked about this in our studies previously. But Christ, when he comes back, he's coming in the clouds of glory. He is not going to set foot on this earth. He's not going to run around on the earth doing miracles before he takes the righteous home. 
When he comes, it is solely for the purpose to bring the righteous back to heaven. So when you hear, which is predicted in the Bible, that there will be all this deception from Satan, that he will come in the form of a light. He will convince people that he's come as Jesus, and he will be doing miracles on the earth himself. He'll, people will flock to go see him. We are told, do not go see him. It is a deception. We know the truth because we read our Bible, and our Bible says when he comes back, He's coming in the clouds. The way he left the earth, he's coming back in clouds. And those of us who believe in Christ and understand the word of God know that he's calling the righteous up out of the grave. Those who will be alive who are righteous will meet him in the air in the clouds. It says that right here in scripture. So I want you to understand we're trying to enlighten you to what the Word of God says and not all these interpretations floating around. That's why we talked before we have so many denominations because people have taken the Bible and they've turned it into what they think people might want to hear, which sounds good. When you die, you immediately go to heaven. Sounds great. Makes us feel comfortable. But guess what? It's not the truth. It's not the truth. And I've spent my life believing that. I've been in other denominations, and I've believed all of it, and it made me feel good. Then when I saw the truth, I'm like, wow, that's not what God says at all. In his word, it's very clear. And we have to read the word of God and let him enlighten us about that. It may not feel so comforting now, but I tell you what, the story's better than it could ever be. It was better than what I thought was good. Because to me, to go to sleep when you die... And all of us be raised together, what a beautiful thought that would be. It wouldn't be fun to know that somebody that's died is up there watching this wicked world. That wouldn't be heaven. So none of that makes any sense now that you think about it. And you really have to think about how perfect God's plan is. We are looking forward to the day that we all get new bodies and we're all together raised up to be with Christ in heaven. What will the immortal body look like? Some people think it's going to be a vapor. You're going to be like air floating around in some kind of visible image. We're not sure. But Philippians 3.20 and 21 tells us, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed to his glorious body. Now, we have sinful mortal bodies today. When we're, re when we're resurrected, we are transformed into these bodies as if sin had never entered our body. You'll maintain your identity. You will still be you. You will have friends who recognize you, of course, the Bible says that our body will be like Christ's body. After the resurrection, you recall, and we're thinking about after the resurrection, what kind of body did Christ have? Mary came to the garden, and there was a gardener there. But he called Mary by name, and she turned around and recognized his voice. He had a body that resembled a human form. Disciples recognized him as they broke bread on the road to Emmaus. He hid himself on the road, and when they broke bread, they recognized him. Recognized him because he was in a bodily form. He wasn't vapor. He wasn't just some bright light. He was actually in a bodily form. We will recognize each other in heaven. We will have bodies like Jesus. We will have bodies like Adam and Eve. We, what, what about the unsaved people? The Bible says in 2 Thessalonians 1, 9, it tells us these shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. When Christ comes, his power will be so strong that only the righteous will, who know him will be taken up with him, and all the wicked will die from the brightness of his coming. They sold their birthright. They sold the eternity for rebellion and for the pleasure of this life. Can you imagine that the pleasures of living on this earth for 80, 90, 100 years is worth giving up, living forever in a perfect body, in a perfect place? 
is that a good trade-off? I think any normal person would say, no, I'll take option two. Option one is not a good option. It's, it's short-term. If you're thinking short-term and long-term, I think the long-term option is a better one. There is nothing on this earth, there's not one single pleasure on this earth that can outweigh even a minute in heaven in the presence of perfection. When Christ comes, his second coming, and the first resurrection of the righteous ones, the righteous dead are resurrected and joined by the righteous living in the air to meet Christ. And all the righteous get to meet Jesus in the air and go on up to heaven. The righteous will spend a thousand years with God, getting questions answered as to why possibly their friends and relatives are not there. They can see why the people that they thought would be there are not there. Meanwhile, all the wicked are still dead. Those wicked who were dead and the wicked who died from the brightness of Jesus' coming, when he came to get the righteous, they, they remain dead. Satan and his evil angels will then be bound to the earth for a thousand years with no one to tempt They'll, into, they'll anticipate their ultimate fate. They'll have a thousand years to think about all that they did. And now there's no one for them to tempt. How cruel is that for somebody who loves to deceive people, not to have a person to deceive for a thousand years? The Bible says in Matthew 8, 11, And I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. The Bible says we can sit down with Abraham. We can ask him how he felt as he raised that knife over his son Isaac before he was going to plunge the knife into Isaac. What were you thinking? How strong was your faith in Christ that you were willing to kill your son? We're going to be able to ask him those questions in heaven. In Hebrews eleven eight, it says, by faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. Abraham followed God even when he didn't know where he was going. How many of us do that? If we hear a voice that might be God speaking into our mind, and we're like, mm, I'm not going to do that. I just don't feel like I'm prepared for that, and I don't know that I can step out in faith like that. That's a dangerous place to be. God wants us to say, I trust you 100% with every ounce of my being, and I'll do what you say, and I'll go where you lead, because I know your plan is so much better than mine. You know the end from the beginning. Why wouldn't I follow your path? We don't know the end from the beginning. We're trying to make ourselves get there, but God says, hey, I have a straight path. It's easy. Follow me. Not that you won't run into obstacles, but I'll be with you so it will be easier for you. But instead, we choose our own path. We make our own decisions. We don't involve God. And then we ask ourselves, why is all this happening to me? Well, you answered your question. You chose your fate instead of relying on God. So we have to be very careful that we have to be careful what we hear, what we see, what we're listening to, what we're watching. We have to let God take control of our mind and not all these devices, electronic devices. People can't stand to be five minutes without their phone in their hand. And I guarantee you, they're not reading Bible scriptures every time they pick up that phone. You know, they're checking a lot of stuff. And stuff nowadays, they're so smart. They know what you're thinking about. Satan knows what you're thinking about. And boom. He'll send something to your phone. You're like, oh, that's just what I was wanting. Uh, you'll be amazed at how tactical he is about putting things in front of you that he wants to tempt you away from studying the word of God and tempt you away from doing the righteous things. So many of you have obediently followed God, prompting you to attend church, to be baptized, to study the word of God, to pray daily, to help others who are less fortunate than you, Many of you have visited the sick and helped a stranger that God put in your path because your mind was tuned in to God's word. You understand the character of God. For you to have it, you need to be focused on the things that God did and that Jesus did when he walked on the earth. He cared for the sick. Jesus visited people who were sick. 
He, he was doing all kinds of things to show mercy and grace and love, and that's what he asks us to do. Think of the experience of Moses. The Bible says in Hebrews eleven twenty four through 27, by faith Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. Moses chose the kingdom of heaven over the things of this earth. Do we do that? Do we make that choice? Do we give up pleasures on this earth for the sake of the kingdom? Hebrews eleven twenty six and 27 adds, Esteeming the reproach of Christ's greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. We need to be reminded not to look at the riches of this earth, which are not anything in comparison to the rewards that he has promised and prepared for us in heaven. Let's keep our eyes focused on the prize, which is heaven, and eternity with God. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. He saw the invisible God. He understood what God wanted him to do. And he chose that over worrying about the wrath of the king. Worrying that he would be killed for what he was trying to do. He put that aside because the riches in heaven are so much greater than any time we have on this earth. We may have to endure hardship and pain while we're here on earth, but we must keep the faith just knowing what awaits us in eternity in our heavenly home. Moses accepted God's reward. It was a major choice, but because of his choice, Moses is in heaven. He could have chosen to be a mummy, a long, dead Egyptian pharaoh wrapped and sealed in a tomb. You will be able to sit down with Moses and ask Moses what it was like crossing the Red Sea between the walls of water when you're in heaven. You can ask Daniel, did you sleep with your head resting on the side of one of those big comfy lions when you were thrown into the lion's den? You can ask Paul, tell me about the bright light that flashed on the road to Damascus. Wouldn't it be incredible to be able to talk to these people who we've only read about? And then ask Peter to tell you about sinking in the waves as he tried to walk on the Sea of Galilee. As we talk to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Peter, James, John, and Daniel, these prophets of past, they may ask us to tell them our story. We live in a different day and time, and they may want to know about the struggles that we endured. Tell me what it was like when you went to prophecy meetings. Tell me what it was like when you asked your boss to take off on the Sabbath and not work just knowing that you might be let go or fired from your job. Tell me about that kind of faith. Tell me about how you were led to baptism, what it was like to worship in your day and time. We'll all share together the greatness of God and all the testimonies that he's given us about Jesus. It will be all about how we got to heaven and what a glorious reunion that will be. At the end of the thousand years, we know the holy city will descend from God out of heaven. John in the book of Revelation shares one of the most magnificent passages in the Bible as he tells us what will happen at the end of the thousand years. Revelation 21, 1 says, Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. What do you mean by no more sea? John was on the Isle of Patmos, and he was separated from his family by the sea. Here he means that there's not going to be any more loneliness and separation. We'll all be together. John says no more sea because he means we're all going to be united. John continues in verse 2. Then I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. John continues, And I heard a great voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them. This is the most significant announcement in the history of the world. The holy city is descending from heaven, and the announcement comes from God. 
God recovers the earth, his lost sheep, in the universe. God transfers the holy city to the redeemed planet. The universe revolves around God's throne, but God moves his throne to this planet, and he makes this planet all new again. Heaven is a real place. As the holy city descends to earth, it captures the attention of the wicked. They are resurrected by God. This is the second resurrection. The first one is for the righteous. The second one, after the city comes down out of heaven to earth, the, the wicked are resurrected by God to receive their final reward. Remember, as the holy city descends in the second resurrection, who is left at this resurrection? Well, we know it's the wicked dead. They are resurrected for their judgment. The wicked surrounded the, bloody, the beloved city in Revelation 20, verse 9. It tells us they went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints in the beloved city. And fire came down from God of heaven and devoured them. Satan and the wicked people are rushing to take this holy city and fire comes down from God and destroys them. Out of the ashes of the old world, God makes a new world. The Bible says in Revelation 21, 4, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Amen to that, right? We're all looking forward to that. It's all over. No more sin, sorrow, tears, no more machine guns, bombs, ghettos, loneliness, disappointment, cancer. Revelation 14, 4 says, these are the ones who follow the lamb wherever he goes. These were redeemed from among men, being first fruits to God and to the lamb. What will we be doing for millions of years in heaven? We will travel with Jesus to distant worlds. We'll be studying the wonders of the universe. Are you interested in nature? Wait until the angels explain to you the mysteries of chlorophyll. Heaven is a place for those whose minds are bright, people who might be inquisitive and want to explore the history of the universe. Isaiah 65, 17 tells us, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered or come to mind. No need to look back at the past and remember all the sad times, the painful things, and the disappointments. God's plan is always better. The prophet Isaiah continues describing the beauties of God's creation. Isaiah 11, verses 6 and 9 says, And the leopard shall lie down with the kid. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. In heaven, nothing brings fear to your heart. No need for iron bars on your windows, alarm systems that call the police. No more fear of disease. We will participate in real activities. Heaven is not a state of mind. It's not make-believe. You're not going to be floating around in the air with nothing to do. Heaven is a real place. The Bible says in Isaiah 65, 21 through 23, they shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards, and they shall eat their fruit. They shall not build one and another inhabit. So you'll build your own home. You'll design it just the way you've always wanted. And you'll be able to plant your gardens and eat your fresh fruit. And my elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain, nor bring forth children for trouble. And for they shall be descendants of the blessed of the Lord and their offspring with them. We will wander magnificent gardens, studying nature together. Heaven is togetherness. It is family. It's discovering new varieties of roses or whatever seems to pique your interest. It is tasting new fruit that's never been tasted before. It's visiting exotic places in the universe. The mind never loses a capacity to learn and grow. Everything delights the eye and it tempts the taste. 
If the Bible is true, then nothing else matters except being in heaven and making sure we can do whatever we have to do to get there. If it's not true, then only death and the grave remains for you. I thank God that one day God's plan for us will absolutely be fulfilled. The Bible says in Isaiah 66, 23, And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, and from one Sabbath to another, all flesh shall come to worship before me, says the Lord. Every month will come and will worship God, eat fruit from the tree of life. Imagine worshiping God in heaven's great temple. Now you notice he says from one Sabbath to another. So if you don't like worshiping on the Sabbath, if you don't want to come to church on the day that God has said you need to come and worship me, you will not enjoy heaven because it will go on forever and ever. So either you get with the program and learn how to love worshiping God on the Sabbath and all that it brings, or you continue to ignore the fourth commandment of God and break that commandment and just stay in sin forever. You have choices to make every day. That's the gift of free will. And so we have to make sure we make the right choices. We study God's word and we follow his plan to make sure we get to this incredible place that we just described. Revelation 22, 1 through 4 says, And he showed me a pure river of water as of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its street and on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations, and there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. It is Sabbath, and we travel to the temple, this resplendent place in the glory of God. We see choirs of angels singing, Holy, Holy, Holy. The Father stands up, and he tells us he created the world. He introduces Jesus, and Jesus says, My Father... Holy Spirit and I created a perfect world, and rebellion interrupted our plans. So I came to earth ready to risk everything, even heaven itself, so each of you could, could be here today. While Jesus is talking, we feel love that we could never have imagined. After the Sabbath service, as we leave the temple, Jesus says, I want to spend time with you personally. How can you do this? You won't have enough time. Jesus says, this is eternity. Time never ends. Jesus comes to your home, you and your beautiful beds of flowers, and Jesus says, I made all these for you. Jesus picks fruit off of a special tree and says, I knew your taste, and I made this flavor just for you. Jesus takes you on a tour of this whole new earth, you go by the river of life, and Jesus puts his arm around you and asks, anything more that I can do for you? He says, the tokens of my love for you are still here in my hands, as you notice a faint scar in the middle of his hands. You know you have never been in the presence of someone who has loved you that much, ever. All you can do is fall on your knees and say, holy, 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 and sing, worthy is the lamb that was slain. Receive blessing and honor and power. Because of the love you feel from Jesus, you will serve and praise him through eternity. Friends, we all need to be there. What a tragedy it would be for you to know about this incredible destiny, this incredible heavenly home on earth, and you not be there because you chose not to be there. Soon the world is going to pass and a new world will be created. Don't miss out on your forever home for the pleasures and the distractions of this short time in this mortal body on this earth. Be sure to give him all of your heart Ask him to guide you the days that you have remaining on this earth and ensure 
you have a place with him forever.